One of the first adjustments they talk about in the initial adjustment section is setting that AC oscillator to uh, one kilocycle, or thousand hertz. And I showed in the last movie that this one was actually set almost perfectly to a thousand hertz. And it's easy to demonstrate on a modern piece of equipment by simply plugging it in and tapping it off here as I had shown on the on off switch is also the generator level. By, by seeing it appear as a waveform on my oscilloscope and, and simply looking down there, I can see this 1,010 hertz. So it's almost perfectly set up. So I really wouldn't do anything else. You know, if it was off, I would, I would then go right here to this, as I point to it on the top side, this trimmer right here and make the necessary adjustment to bring that to 1,000 and wouldn't go any further. However, because we're going off of this manual here, what, what we want to do is say, how would we do this if we were doing it properly? And what I'm going to do is, is attempt to recreate uh, the parameters that would be done to, to uh, configure this properly. So I have a, a generator, right, that I'm, I'm going to use, a, a, a waveform generator for, for a sine wave. And obviously I have this unit and I have the oscilloscope and what I'm going to do is I'm going to configure this oscilloscope as it would be configured if it was an old school oscilloscope that we can uh, use the same parameters that would be used back then to achieve the same desired output so let's do that now and I really like to get these things done because I'd like to really clean up this bench so we could get started with the with the really fun testing so I have my um, channel one going to the uh, function generator and, and channel two is going to the top of this unit, the, the input, if you would, where components are set up. And I have it purposely detuned. It's not set to a thousand hertz, right? Uh, at least uh, the function generator is not set to a thousand hertz because obviously I don't want to adjust for the unit here because I don't want to adjust the trimmer capacitor if I don't have to, right? So, so I have one in channel one and one in channel two. And, and on a modern oscilloscope where you, where you can't set the, the, the horizontal vertical plates, right? Because we have just two vertical inputs. Uh, there's a function that you should have instead of uh, X and Y as separate, you could have X and Y, uh, um, X and Y as, as, you know, vertical and horizontal. And you could see that button right there in DSO mode, right? So I go and press that button right here. And um, we end up with, with this. And, and ideally what we're looking for is a circular pattern, right? When, when X and Y uh, should, should have the matching uh, uh, frequency, it should just be around circle or close to it. You know, there's going to be some oscillation in here. And right now I'm, I'm actually sitting at 642 hertz. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to slowly bring this up, and, and to make it easier, I'm going to change the persistency here, just so I get some... It just it, it gives it more of an analog look to it. Like, uh, um, try and get this camera behind here like that. More of an old school look. And I'm, I'm slowly going to increase the frequency, and I want you to watch what happens. Now, obviously, I would have the function generator at a thousand. I'd be adjusting the unit, not the other way around. But you get the point here. So, basically, I'd be I'd be turning the trimmer cap, and as you could turn the trimmer cap, as we start to get it into phase, we could see that that things are starting to change. Right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna make it more. I'm at 939. 900 and 50, right, 975, and this is what you would have seen on, an, in, on a very old oscilloscope back in the day, 990, 95, 97, 999, and this is exactly one, and we know it's not set for one. So let me let me see how much I could tweak this. Very little. I guess two point. I don't know which way I'm I'm going when I do this because you know I'm I'm, I'm messing with the. I think I think it I think it's close enough though. The 
point is that you get that close to a circle already. I mean, you're you're really looking at it. Just, it takes so so little fluctuation to make that circle flip around that it really doesn't matter. And, and considering that that a thousand is not critical, this is what they really expected you to get when you set it for a thousand. So on an old-fashioned oscilloscope, having a circle like that would have really really got you as close as possible to a thousand. And what I have my function generator set up for is, is actually a thousand, just under a thousand and, and ten, I believe. So let's, I think, I think that's where, where it's at. Yeah, so I'll call that close enough. It's also jitter on the output too, which, which would make that more difficult. But there you go. This is how that would have been done except for the fact that instead of adjusting the frequency on the um, frequency generator, the function generator, I would have been doing so on the, um, the trimmer pot over here to get that desired effect that you're seeing right there, which is uh, basically uh, two signals of the same frequency in the XY uh, function mode. The next calibration is the calibration of the CRL knob. This is a very important calibration. Um, this is done with a 550 ohm precision resistor. And for our purposes, we have made a 0.01% uh, 550 ohm resistor that I have uh, in combination of two resistors here together. Uh, this is put into the top here. That takes the place of the 550. Uh, we're set for DC internal. Uh, for our um, setup, our, our output here is set to uh, DC shunt. We're set to obviously 100 ohm as our multiplier. And what we're looking for is basically when we set our, our CRL outer knob by 5, what we want is the inner knob set to 5, which gives us with 100, 550 to match the resistor that when we turn to meter, we should see no deflection at all, right? So in our case, we see no deflection. The point obviously is that we would actually have the inner uh, um, uh, resistor turned to such a position that we would have no deflection, and then we would push this knob down uh, over the dot five to set it up in that position, which I have obviously done so at five five, right? So this is all set up in that position. If I were to deviate in any way whatsoever, which I will just show you, um, putting it to dot five five five, and then turn the meter over, you would see that there obviously is some sort of deflection right now. And now that everything is lined up, the deflections are, are pretty much predictable, which is ironic. If I could bring it back just uh, a half of that, you would see that half of that now comes back. I bring that again, and then we get two boxes I bring that a quarter of the way, and I get half a box, and then I bring it back. So, I wouldn't know what to call it, graticules. We could actually look at it with regard to percent, right? Because it goes from 0 to 100. Let me get that back on 5 there. So, and we can see that it's 0. So, we are 0% are off from the scale at 550. At uh, 560, we find ourselves 20% uh, off. So we would expect that at 570, we would find ourselves 40, I'm not quite on 70, but at 570, we would find ourselves 40% off. I imagine at 580, we'd find ourselves around 60% off. So, so this is all working out really specific, right? So bring it back to 550, 0% off. Everything is calibrated perfectly. This is the point where we say that the CRL knob is done with regard to calibration. We're going to move on to our uh, box. We're going to set up some criteria on, on a notepad that allows us to exercise the outer wheel from 0 through 9 while also exercising the inner wheel while at the same time also exercising the multipliers, right? So I have to come up with a, a sort of schema that allows for this. And if I have any 0 0.01 resistors left over in between, I'm going to want to include them as controls in between those as well. And that's what we're going to do now. It's also measured in the book for the purposes of resistance that we should see what the resistance is of the binding posts themselves and the internal circuitry, right? So in the book, it says uh, 0 0.02 is what we should be seeing. 
Um, that would be if I used heavy wire on the post, but for all practical purposes, I'm not measuring heavy wire. I'm measuring resistors that I tie down with these posts. So I use these clips right here. And what I found when I measured my connections right here is I ended up with 0 0.03 and change. So we ended up with a, um, 0 0.037. So that's just a number that you can use as a, as a reference, which really only matters for very low resistance measurements that you know the internal resistance of the device so that you know to subtract it from your final value, right? So another thing in the book worth mentioning and worth knowing. Of course, my curiosity got the better of me and I tried a dead copper short using the original lugs and with a dead short on copper, I ended up with 0 0.022. So when you look at it, you know, actually, actually you ended up with like 0 0.02 so as a matter of fact we ended up exactly what with with what the book said but it, it ended up with 0 0.021 so so pretty pretty much on point with what the documentation said it gives me a good feeling that the work that we've done pretty much matches up with what we would expect so yeah so that's the internal resistance of the unit i think for our first practical demonstration of the unit we're going to measure resistance uh, resistance is one that uses uh, DC as opposed to AC for measurement, okay? Uh, for this, we have our calibrated 550 that we used previously. We used this for the calibration, but I didn't get into function. Uh, for this purpose, we would turn the, the unit on, but we wouldn't turn the uh, generator up. We would just turn it on so the the light turned on. And we would set our function, obviously, to R, because that's what we're working with, resistance. And we would set it to DC internal. Uh, could use uh, external. There is option to uh, 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 use uh, external batteries for purposes of getting even more precise measurements of resistance. It's beyond the scope of what we're doing right now. Um, the meter comes shunted by default. And, and that's so it doesn't bounce everywhere while you're working with it. Uh, to remove that and make it extremely sensitive, there's a spring-loaded mechanism, as was discussed. <clears throat> I have the CRL set for zero and zero. And our unknown value is obviously 550 ohms. But um, we start at the bottom here. I just have it, happen to have it turned, and we don't know what it is for. But as I move it up, we'll see what we get. And all of a sudden, we appear on the screen. And I guess, you know, you could go up to... 1k and you could go up to to 10k and ultimately with something like 10k if you're already at zero you can imagine that it would be pretty sensitive if you already used a multiplier of one and have already gone past the screen that would mean that you're going to start at zero point something to get the value you're going to be measuring a whole a very small value down there you can see the 10k is already not feasible <clears throat> there's, there's not a whole lot of trickery associated with this obviously if there's not a whole lot of room to work you're really not going to work in that sort of room right but just because we're we're going through this you'd look at 1k and you say okay uh, 1k if i if i were to turn the knob to one as a multiplier i've already gone past the two you know so so with 1k already i already know that i have to go with zero point something as the multiplier right so, at 1K, it's going to be sitting down somewhere here. And in, in actuality, 1K will work if you think about it, because um, if you do the math, it's going to be 1 times 0 plus 0.55, right? So it would be uh, 550, right? And if I hit meter... And I'm not actually not far off, and, and obviously it's really hard to do the meter and hold the camera, you know, at the same time for this. But you can see that if I if I brought it, got it, well, I went the wrong direction. But if I get it just just in the right spot, you can see that I can use the one K to get it right there. And you can see that, believe it or not, it did in fact land right on 550. That's pretty good, right? 
ideally that's not what we would do, it would work. The math is correct. So you see 1 times 0 is 0 plus 550, so in the in thousands, so that'll work. But ultimately, it would make more sense to use more of the adjustment that's available to us. You know, we would look at it and say, okay, now we have some room to work and something like this. You know, I turn that knob and we would start turning this, see where we're going. And that's that's up to five. And six is too far. You know, we've already gone too far at six. Now we're up to five. And then we start turning that. And we get we check the needle. No, we're not close enough yet. And then we turn a little more. We check the needle again and we're still a little bit low. And we check again and we're a little bit high. You know. Obviously, this goes a lot quicker when you have two hands, and then we get it right where we want to be. We end up with a multiple of 100 times 5 and 5. So, 100 times 55 is 550. So, we end up with the 550 ohm resistor, which is exactly what we have. You have to understand the math here. Uh, I, I see that this is confusing. You know, because that's the multiplier, and it's it's five plus it's five plus five, but it's it's not like plus five. It's five. It's the dot five. So you can see the the little decimal point in there. If I if I zoom in, so it's five dot five. So so you have to look at it in that in that context. There is a decimal point there. So when you when you multiply them together, you end up with with five hundred and fifty, which is exactly what we're looking for. And that is the beginning and end of um, uh, doing resistance measurement on this extremely specific, um, very high tolerance, very exact, you know, uh, more exact than the fluke over there. So very good indeed, very happy. This has to work before you could do any other measurements on here. So it's very important that that resistance works. So now we'll move on to the other measurements. In testing the sweep of the C, um, CDQ potentiometers, obviously the best ways with the uh, IM11 Heathkit, uh, helping Heathkit. So basically what I'm doing is just using the uh, resistance mode to check the sweep as displayed with the dial. We're just going up the sweep and making sure everything is okay. So a slow turn of the dial at the appropriate range shows everything good. I get a little bump right at the end on this particular one, but that's all the way at the top of the range beyond what's used so I'm not overly concerned about that you'll see it so just a little bump right there this one is good uh, the other one is uh, 16,000 and that one appears to be good too we'll go through that one really quick here's the second one you gotta go slow with this one this one's rather sensitive especially as you work your way down this one has a nice sweep across it There you go, there's the second one. Bring that back up. The third one is worth noting is 165 ohms and it starts at the highest resistance at zero as opposite of the others which start at the at zero ohms at zero position. And this one is a little bit more squirrely because I'm at zero right now at 165. And as I turn it up, we don't get that smooth sweep that we were seeing on the other ones. As I slowly come up, at the beginning it's okay. And I take my hand off and I start my turn again. See a little bumpiness there. Some bumpiness there. Especially up top. This potentiometer needs to be cleaned, there's no doubt. Problem is, it's going to be a challenge to get into this thing. This thing is almost hermetically sealed, so we're going to have to find a technique to get that thing cleaned up. Turned out a whole section of wire was broken. Having found that I had lost the battle on this um, somewhat hard to find triple potentiometer, I decided to cut my losses in an attempt to do surgery with a soldering iron. And it actually turned out to be successful. And I was able to repair the uh, 
two areas you see here. There's a little sort of indent right here. I don't know what the purpose of this indent is, but you could see it. That sits around the value of five, right? So there's that indent. And at that indent, it had broken. And I was able to solder those connections. And then shortly after that indent, you could see that I put another bridge right there. And with that, you know, the squirreliness is gone. Everything works again. It's nice and smooth. I lost about one, maybe two ohms, but well within the tolerance of the unit. So I'm not worried. But, you know, I broke it apart. I was able to fix it. It went from junk to being usable again. So as far as I'm concerned, this is still a winner. We're going to put it back up on the uh, potential on the uh, multimeter and test it out. So here it is. I'm going to I'm going to uh, bring it up from zero or or from the beginning, and I'm going to I'm going to call out when it hits that that uh, point on the potentiometer, that little click. So I'm going to slowly dial it up. And we're dialing it up. Everything is nice and smooth now. I also had the opportunity, obviously, since it's cracked open, to to clean out everything, you know. And we're approaching it, and it just locked in there at 35, right? So now I'm going to move past 35. This is where I did my repairs. And you can see that everything, again, continues to be nice and smooth. And we're well away from the repairs at this point. And it's dialing up again. And we're at the end. So repair is good. Everything's nice and smooth. I'm going to bring it back up again on the uh, on the analog to take a look at it one last time. But I think that the repairs are done. And here we have it back up on the analog. We're going to dial it up to 160. I'll point out when we hit that little ravine. And I'm stopping turning. Stopping turning. Hit the ravine. And I'm stopping turning. Stopping turning. And I'm at the end. So now we have nice smooth play from that potentiometer. That's a big difference from before. We're going to call that fixed. I'm going to find a way to cover that up from dust and, and that's going to be the end of that. The following demonstration will talk about getting the value of a capacitor. That is the capacitance of a capacitor. We're not going to be getting into too much about the dissipation factor in this demonstration, although we'll touch on it briefly. So when talking about getting into the capacitance, we're going to set our function to dq, as shown here, capacitance dq. Uh, the assumption is that the dissipation factor would be greater than 1 if there was a dissipation factor at all. And while it's not important or trivial at this time, we would be setting it to 0 to uh, 1.0 right here. So this is what would be used as a default. This would only be used as a secondary measurement. The gem level would be turned into the on position, but all the way off. That is to say, clicked on, but not turned up at this time. AC would be set to internal. Um, this demonstration would be using the 1000 hertz reference, the 1 kilohertz reference source internally generated by this unit, as would most of the uh, um, functions on this unit, right? As for the output, we're going to be using the um, the microammeter here, the galvanometer. We're not going to be using headphones or the oscilloscope for this demonstration. You could hook up headphones to hear if you have really good hearing, or you could hook up an oscilloscope to null out the, um, the uh, 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 waveform, which would be extremely useful in using an oscilloscope. I'm not doing that in this demonstration, perhaps in another demonstration to show how that works. But for our purposes here, we'll be using um, internal, right? AC set zero knob, then just leave it north for now, whatever. Okay, so this is a somewhat academic. I've got a, a, a capacitor of what we're going to call unknown value at this time. And basically how this works is, is we're going to want to set the AC zero to put it all the way on the left hand side uh, where, where we have our left hand hundred. So the meter at, at a meter reading of left side zero or, or all the way down, right? And that's what we're really shooting for. We're not using it by the numerical context of the meter, right? And what we're attempting for is that when we turn up the gen level, because we don't know what to set our multiplier for yet, Obviously, if you knew the value of the capacitor and you're trying to test it, you could forego all this. But the assumption is that you don't, right? So 
we're going to do this first the right way in accordance with the documentation. All right. So when you turn up the gem level, you should be able to get it up to the halfway point, which is the zero marker. So as I try and turn it up, right, I'm turning up the knob and I'm getting to the zero marker right here, right? Wait, I'm, I'm, I apologize. I turned it back down. The, the, the knobs, all these should be reset to zero first before we do any of this because that would be pretty useless, right? That's zero, that's zero. Okay, fine. So, so I turn up gen level, and as I'm turning up gen level, we can see that nothing's happening. The gen level is all the way up. And that should tell us right there that, that whatever this capacitor is, it's clearly not going to function in the 10 microfarad range. So we turn up for a range. We make sure that our, our AC set zero is still on, on there. And I have to look because I got some parallax issues here. And then let's try for gen level again. And I turn it all the way up and I, and I still got nothing. So I know that that one's not going to work. And now we're at 0.1 microfarad. Let's try again. And I'm turning it up, and now I, I turn it all the way up, at least I got a, I got a bump. And I know that's not working, but it's a step in the right direction. So I'm bringing it back down. AC set level's good. And then we're at 0 0.01 microfarads. Now let's turn it up. And turn it a bit slower. And now I know I could get past. Let me see what my sweep is. So it looks okay. It looks okay. So let me go to zero and see if we could do this, right? So we're at zero. You realize if this wasn't on video, this would all go so very quickly, right? So now we're at zero, all right? So the AC set zero was done. The gem level brought this up to balanced, right? So we're balanced at zero. Now, what we're going to do is very much like resistance now. We're going to pull a, a value from the CRL knob, okay? So our, our dissipation factor is zero as well. So I turn the CRL knob, and right off the bat, as I turn the CRL knob to one, it's already it already overshot at one so i could go to zero and attempt to turn the knob like this right so four or five and i could see watch this it's very hard to do So I could say that that in, in, in turning this knob back and forth to the best of my abilities, right, to, to try and get that, you know, that, that highest point before the dip, I end up with 0, 4, 7, right? So we end up with 0 0.01 times... 0 0.47 right so we end up with 0 0.047 microfarads of um <clears throat> of of capacitance right so it's what what i would like to think is that actually i'm i'm doing the math a bit wrong here what I would like to think is that we could we could do this a bit differently. It's actually what I'm saying is 0.0047 is is what is what our number equates to because we end up we end up actually with a zero here. So what I what I would like to say is that we could actually do this to, to have a better resolution. Let me turn this back to zero, right? Turn this turn this down again. Like if we wanted to get a more precise value out of this, make sure it's still on zero there. Turn our knob again. Now, set the AC zero as we did. Make sure it's right. Sometimes my air conditioner turns on, right? Set that to zero. And now we can use the outer multiplier of our CRL knob. So now we're at 0.001, right? Oh, we moved a bit. Right, 0.001. Now I could go one, two, I know sometimes it's in the knob loops, right? Three, four, right? Now I got my inner knob. Right? 
we find that the furthest bump out that it has sits right there just just beyond four seven and we end up with point zero zero one times four dot seven so we end up with point zero zero four seven as our final value and to save some time in this video when I measured it on the uh, um, the other meter I ended up with point zero zero six five so as it turns out this is actually quite precise and the other meter could have been off slightly due to you know how it was mounted in there and whatnot so this is how you can very accurately accurately measure capacitance what I didn't show you on this was the dissipation factor, because as it turns out on, on these particular capacitors, there is no dissipation factor, because if I turn the dissipation factor knob, you can see it's, it's sort of detuning, because dissipation factor is zero. So obviously the furthest out it's going to be is at zero itself, because there is no dissipation factor on these. The ESR would be, as a matter of fact, absolutely immeasurable on a device like this, it would not even know that the capacitor is connected because there's just no appreciable ESR on these particular capacitors as it would be on, say, an electrolytic capacitor. So this is how we measure capacitance on this unit with a great deal of accuracy. I'll probably measure another one a little bit quicker as an example. Just to give an understanding of the uh, dissipation factor with regard to tuning in an electrolytic capacitor. Here's a, a 10 microfarad electrolytic capacitor. I have this one perfectly tuned in right now, right? And it reads <clears throat> 8.5 microfarads. I'll have you know that on the digital capacitor meter, it actually reads 8.41. So they're, they're very close. Uh, with regard to tuning this in, to get it to 8.5 to read perfectly, it has to be set up that, that the dissipation factor reads uh, 2 on this particular capacitor, right? So if I were to leave the dissipation factor alone, you would see that what you'd actually get is, is actually off kilter, right? And no amount of adjustment is, is going to improve upon this, right? So if I, I try and change the capacitance, you know, it'll peak and go up and down, but it'll never get to where it needs to be because once you dial in the CRL knob, you know, just like everything else, you, you sort of get this peak and, 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 and it comes back down in the other direction, but you'll never get it optimal. With regard to, to capacitors, it's the, the secondary sort of, you know, ideal balance, right? And then when you hit two, obviously if I go further, it'll become less ideal and start going in the other direction. So again, you know, there's the secondary condition about this circuit that allows for this to happen. My challenge with this unit, without going too deep into this video, is there's something wrong here. Because when you take this and put it back into the equation uh, to derive the ESR from the dissipation factor, you'll find that the number 2 is extremely too high to get this value. And I think that will be appropriate for a different video. But this does work the the knob the circuitry everything inside here does work because at the end of the day the circuitry is allowing for extremely accurate capacitor readings and if you look at the values that i've i've been working with so far with regard to capacitance right i mean we've got some double capacitors here on the left you'll see this unit you know the values that i've gotten and, and their dissipation factors on the right is the digital unit right in, in microfarads you know and some of them are, are really small values right you know some nanofarad values there and on the bottom i did one that was actually 210 picofarads that read on the digital unit 225 and when you get to those values it it also comes down to where you're clamping it on the actual capacitor adds to the amount of picofarad of capacitance like the way you're clamping on the terminal leads because the values are that small i'm going to say adding on to resistance capacitance came out perfect on this unit the test has passed the jury is out on dissipation factor and i'm probably going to turn to some folks for some help there's going to be a, a separate video to cover dissipation factor 
as far as the in internal circuitry goes or as far as, as the readings on that knob goes because there's something wrong with the values for dissipation factor or there's something wrong with my equation for dissipation factor as far as trying to derive a value from that. So we're going to have to see what's going on with that. Also, while I'm here, I'm going to, I'm going to point out that my, my new clipboard came from my, my friend and coworker, Frank, who has sent this to me um, from all the way from the far reaches of Kansas. Uh, I'm using it now in my, uh, in my uh, work area here. It is a, it is a clipboard that is made from a recycled uh, circuit board and and it's pretty awesome. Thank you, Frank. I appreciate that very much So this is what we got. This is what we got. So now we have we have resistance done. We have capacitance done uh, This is still a problem and if this is obviously going to be a problem with dissipation, it's going to be a problem with Q So it's our next thing to deal with It also mentions in the book that for greater accuracy once you have it dialed in with the uh, measurement for the capacitance and the um, dissipation factor to ramp up the generator level. And as you ramp up the generator level, you'll see that it's slightly detuned. And this makes it more sensitive and allows you to dial in that last amount that'll give you the the more precise reading on on the uh, on the dials. It's just a, that last final bit that'll you know, allow for a more accurate reading. So in doing so, just a slowly ramping of the generator level will, will give you the more exacting amount. And we end up with 8.47. So um, a, a, also a slight correction of the dissipation factor as well. So that's how we get a, a, per, a more precise reading for measuring capacitors. As a last practical demonstration, I've changed the output to external and I've hooked up my oscilloscope to the external detector. Uh, for this purpose, I've detuned the CRL knob to seven microfarads. We know that it's at around 8.4. And the reason for that is obviously if the bridge is imbalanced, we'll, we'll see a, a waveform, which is about 1000 Hertz, right? And we see that waveform now. And right now it's sitting at seven. I can't show you the oscilloscope and the device at the same time, so you'll have to take my word for it. And the thing is that obviously as we approach the correct value, the, the waveform disappears. So we're sitting at seven. And, and as I slowly turn the dial up, you know, towards eight, you can see, you can see it disappearing. But obviously as I use the dial, I, I could only go so far. So I, I'll turn it back down to seven and then I'll, I'll click it up to eight. And there it is at eight. And you can see, obviously I'm losing my, my triggering as it gets smaller, but eventually you'll, you'll hit it and you'll null out right at, at the right point. And then as you go past it, the wave comes back. So somewhere at, at that right point where the um, where the needle would balance is is where you'd be at the right spot. So as I would turn it, you know, as we would try and balance that needle, you would see it would sit right at that that right point right there at, at um, well pretty much the same setting we had at the last time, right? So when we when we did that that measurement where we brought it all the way up and we sat said that it sat there just below that point right there. It turned out to be you know, roughly the very same point. I could, I could, you know, make that a little bit bigger and get a little bit more resolution, or I could sit there and fiddle with this. You know, here's our our, our dissipation factor knob, and get that right where we want it to be. You know, which is which turned out to be, you know, when we when we did our measurement there, just just above two for the very accurate measurement. But you could see how adding an oscilloscope gives us a greater degree of accuracy as opposed to this. The question is, how much accuracy do you really need at that point? This is obviously sufficient. You don't need to fire up the oscilloscope every time you do all this stuff. But I believe this covers, uh, for the purposes of capacitors, uh, everything that we need. Unfortunately, with the issue with this, we're not going to uh, show this function working because this function only deals with values that are one and less between zero and one is when when we would flip to this knob and that would turn this small range here into the entire length of this knob uh dissipation factor is not working like i said that's going to be a different video and because it's not working while i'm confident that we could get the henry value of an inductor i'm pretty sure that we're not going to be able to get an accurate cue 
So we're going to see if we can get, yeah, that's probably for another video though.